All right, Paul, we just, so we kind of understand now how our solar system came to be, why we have ice giants on the far edge, those gas giants, the inner rocky things, but there's a bit more to it. You know, how do we actually start getting and diving into, and what do we know about the more specific composition, structures, geology yeah. of all of these things? This is kind of the field we call planetology, which is if you've got a lump of elements, we know what sort of elements we've got yep. floating in space, it's going to turn into a planet. But what sort of planet? Why are planets so, in some ways, similar, in some ways, different? That's right. I mean, because you can. Why is Jupiter the way it is, and Saturn the way it is, and Mars, and so on? So, what I'm going to do is rather than go through the solar system planet at a time and talk about here's what Jupiter's like, here's what Saturn is like, I'm going to try and come to some sort of understanding about what underlying principles control what they're all like. So, we're going to look at physical consequences and events and mechanisms and how they interact with everything in the solar system. That's right. So our starting point, we're going to start look at what these things are made out of. And we know it's basically these elements and that the things that are made of the gases, hydrogen oxygen, are going to be much more abundant. And that's why you get the high density inner planets and the low density outer planets. Yep. Now, the first question is, this is our theory, right? So from our solar system theory, we know it should be eyes further out and rock further in. But how do we actually know what a planet is made out of? I mean, we haven't landed on most of them. No, that's right. I mean. Uh Obviously, Earth is probably an easy one to figure yeah. out, right? So we can go and take samples of rocks from the Earth and put them through a mass spectrometer or whatever and actually see what they're made out of. But we can't dig that deep relatively, though, on Earth. No, so that's tells you the surface layers of the Earth. We know a bit about what's further down by looking at lava as it comes out. But what's right in the core, that never comes out as lava. So we're only inferring what's there from the density and from the seismic waves that pass through it. Yep. So, for example, the surface of the Earth is quite depleted in iron and nickel because we think that's probably all melted and sunk down to the middle. Um, but we've got at least a rough idea of what the Earth is made out of. Now, there has at least been one other place that we have directly grabbed rocks from, right? That's right, and that's the Moon. We've taken samples again from the surface of the Moon, and we've put them through mass spectrometers, and like many of that work done here at the ANU. And so we know what the Moon is made out of, and again, it's made of the same sort of minerals that the Earth is made out of, same stuff. Well, in fact, you know, the, the last astronaut who went to the Moon was a geologist and just happened to take the most rocks of anyone back. Yes. We've also got sample missions yes. that have visited a few asteroids. So this is the Hayabusa 2, the Japanese mission. And here it is collecting a sample from the surface of an asteroid, which it brought back and dumped in Australia. So it's very difficult to collect a sample from an asteroid. Here it comes down. And essentially could just kind of vacuum collides with it to grab it. shadow coming up, bang. There's a whole bunch of stuff that scurries off. And only a tiny few specks have actually made it into that container. But they were very excited because I think the five or six grams that they got was way more than you needed. That's right, because they can do analysis, as we'll see in a minute, in, in very tiny bits of something. So we have now an asteroid where we physically have grabbed stuff and come back to Earth. So we've got a yeah. few things. And we've got meteorites. Um, now, the way you pick up meteorites is you normally find some place on Earth that's very flat and doesn't have anything else. It could either be a desert like this, or mostly nowadays it's Antarctica. That's right. I mean, Australia is not bad, though. We're pretty flat and dry here. Yeah, too many kangaroos and <laughs> gum trees. But if you take some really barren place in the Nullarbor Plain, you can have a view like this, and anything that's a different colored rock might well be a meteorite. Um, but on places like Antarctica, there are dry valleys where the ice has slowly evaporated, leaving all the rocks that are collected over millions of years on the surface. So that's the best place for meteorite hunting. And most of the meteorites come from the asteroid belt, as we'll see a bit later. But there are also a few from the Moon and from Mars, most likely. And so because these are fragments of rock from those places that we obviously have landed here, we have an indirect way of having rocks from there that we can study physically in the lab here. That's right. And we see that, once again, you know, Mars and the asteroid belt are made of pretty much the same stuff as the Earth and the Moon. So we at least have a few ways of the nearish by things of kind of directly getting a sample of what they're like. But it'd be really good to find out what things that we can't actually bring samples home are made out of. Now, one way to do this is uh, spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is taking light and breaking it into the component wavelengths. And one way that this is done, this is the Mars Curiosity rover. It has a laser on the top, and it fires this laser at rocks. And it's actually, it does it autonomously now. So it doesn't re rely on people on, from Earth telling it what to do. It'll just randomly pick any rocks it sees and zap them. So there's a laser shooting autonomous robot on Mars, is what you told me. track its path if you're a criminologist <laughs> by looking at all the holes in the rock. Um, but what it does is when it zaps the rock, 
rock is vaporized, a little bit of gas comes out, and that gas is hot, and that causes it to produce emission lines. We talk about the spectra in the stars, of course, yep. at great length, but you'll see sp in different wavelengths, you'll see spikes, particular wavelengths. This is down in the ultraviolet, and this will tell you different elements that are present. And so they can look at essentially what elements are present and in what kind of ratios to measure what the geology and composition is of that location. And once again, you're seeing the same elements you talked about all the way through, the same few common elements that make up all the rocky planets. So by and large, Mars seems to be made of the same things as the Earth and the asteroids and, and the Moon. But we've only really have sent rovers to Mars and, well, we have a couple on the Moon. What do we do with the other places? Well, it turns out you can also do this without landing. Okay. So here, for example, is the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and it looks down and one of the instruments on it, and in fact most probes and even telescopes on Earth have similar instruments, is a spectrometer, an infrared spectrometer. So what it does is it takes the, the light from each pixel and spreads it out into different wavelengths. So between the optical blue and the mid-infrared. And what you can see here is different types of elements, sulfates, clay and silicates, have different amounts of light they reflect as a function of wavelength. Okay. So if it's a sulfate, it's reflecting quite a lot out here at you know, near infrared, then it has these dips here. Whereas silicate olivine has a big dip here, it's about one micron, and then rises up over there. So you can look at the different colors of light, see where it's brightest and faintest, and then get a, an estimate of what the composition is from the surface. Now you have to look mostly at the infrared to make this work. So it's not light that human eye can see, uh -huh. but spacecraft can see it just fine. Um, and you'd bright, divide up into much more than three colors. Yeah. Again, something we talked about a lot in the stars course. But with this, you can deconvolve things. Here, for example, is where the Opportunity Lander came down. And no, the Curiosity rover. Yes. Get the right rover here. And landed there and since then has been wandering up around here. And this is the view from space. And you can see by getting the spectra that there's a, a ridge of probably basalt sand dunes. Then there's a hematite ridge and uh, some clay. Sulfates and some clay. They're really excited. So they've deliberately driven the rover on a flat path through here to sample all these different layers. So what they've been able to do is to get a, a rough estimate of what the composition is from orbit from space mm -hmm. and then send the rover across these to compare and see a little bit more specifically what it's made up of? Yes, and you can do this for all the planets and for the gas giants you can see what their atmospheres are made of in a similar way with spectroscopy. And indeed it seems that the inner planets are all made of pretty much the same stuff. You're not going to find some new element like kryptonite or unobtainium <laughs> on any of these planets. Well that's kind of disappointing, but okay. It's just going to be the same boring silicon, magnesium, oxygen in about the same ratios as on the Earth. <laughs> which makes sense because they all form from the same spinning cloud of dust and gas. And in the outer solar system, it's ice, and in the case of Jupiter and Saturn, lots of hydrogen and helium. And you, you can see the spectra of ices on Pluto and all various moons out there. So uh, we can kind of work out what these things are made out of, and it's pretty much what you'd expect from how they all formed. Okay.